Now, many of you have been asking what's happened to the features involving Chris Boardman's ritual humiliation of Ned Bolting in the name of education and entertainment. Well, he's still dishing out the humiliation, it's just that now he's turned on his own family. Here's Chris's breakdown of the anatomy of a tour winner featuring George Boardman having the breakdown. Cycling is arguably the most taxing sport in the world, and within that, the tour is the hardest of all challenges. So what does a tour contender's body have to go through during that gruelling event? Well, we've come to Loughborough University, Britain's premier exercise and sports science centre, to find out. To illustrate just how remarkable these athletes are, we need a fit club rider willing to partake in some barely human trials. So, 185.6 height and 77.3 kilograms. Filling that role will be another boardman, George, who has the perfect characteristics for the part, fit enough to cope, probably, and sufficiently innocent to have agreed before knowing what it was he was volunteering for. There are many factors that make up a tour rider's physiology, but there's one they don't even get to pass go without a big engine. George is now in the process of undergoing two tests familiar to all pro riders, a sub-maximal and maximal test to define his physical abilities. That will allow us to compare and contrast him with the world's best and who better to use as yardstick than the reigning tour champion. This is the maximal test. The resistance he's pedalling against has increased at a rate of 30 watts a minute until he can do no more or he throws up, whichever comes first. The power he sustains for his final minute before failure is referred to as his max aerobic power. Think surging and attacking. George might be race fit, but I don't think Froome is going to be losing to sleep just yet. Now, for time trials where power and aerodynamics dominate, these numbers are a decent indicator of the outcome. But when the road starts to go uphill, the next factor comes into play. In the mountains, gravity takes its toll and weight becomes a much bigger consideration. To have a chance at staying with the front group, riders will need to be able to squeeze out about six watts for every kilo of body weight. To illustrate why this number is so important, we're going to see what happens to his power and pulse as we slowly increase the gradient. With expert help, we've estimated Froome's numbers here so you can get a feel for the difference between fit and tour winner. At 4%, a gradient that barely warrants the term climb in the big race, the demand to sustain a leisurely 15 k's an hour has risen from a negligible 50 watts on the flat to 182. By the time we get to 7.5%, the average gradient of, say, the Col de Tourmalet, you can see what his tall frame is costing him. Now, beyond his sustainable power, he's got just minutes before he explodes. Froome, on the other hand, is still cruising. The maximum gradient in this year's Tour de France is about 13%. It comes on stage 19 at the foot of the final climb up the side of Mont Blanc. Now, that might not sound or look like much, but you can see what it's doing to our test subject, and that's just at 15 k's an hour. So our tour contenders have proved themselves to have a big engine and able to squeeze out every last drop from each gram of muscle. But there are still other factors that will whittle down the select group even further. Because they, of course, aren't riding in a lab, they're doing it in a dynamic environment. Hurry up, a couple more stops to make yet. Here in the environmental department, we're able to add in the final two factors that are going to stress the riders' bodies, and the first of those is heat. Now, the core body temperature has to remain an amazingly stable 37 degrees. In fact, if it rises more than four, the athlete could be in mortal danger. Don't worry about that, George. So being able to regulate it is a major limiting factor for an endurance athlete. Our primary method of getting rid of excess heat is sweating, and to facilitate this, acclimatised riders have a considerably higher blood volume than the average person. On hot days, it's not unusual for them to drip away in excess of two litres an hour in an attempt to maintain their operating temperature. When they get a few hundred metres up, the humidity levels tend to drop and the drier air aids evaporation even further, but sadly, it's more a case of swapping one problem for another. Passing through the Pyrenees, they broke the 2,000-metre barrier, a height at which the available oxygen level dropped by a quarter. Not only is it now 36 degrees in here, a typical tour hot day, but the oxygen concentration has been dropped to 16.5% to mirror that altitude. 
Riders who hail from high altitude have a distinct advantage in these conditions as their bodies have adapted to the heat and the habitual scarcity of the life-giving gas. They have more oxygen-carrying red blood cells and are likely to have grown more of the tiny capillaries deep in the muscle to transport the precious gas to where it's needed. So what does that mean for our poor test subject? Well, his overall physiological capacity has been substantially reduced. Whilst he could sustain 250 watts comfortably at sea level, the height and heat had taken their toll so dramatically it proved impossible to even complete the 20-minute trial. With the amount of abuse they have to take, it's a wonder the athletes' bodies don't just shut down after a few days. And, of course, in some cases, they do. Looking at Geraint Thomas here, and he's been dropped again on the climb. Now, Phil, when you look at a guy putting his head down like this, that's a sign. Well, they're puffing there of uh, the, the cheeks coming out. He's having a hard day. So it's not surprising that the teams have spent decades looking for ways to aid recovery. Go on, then. Don't be so soft. Get down. Some teams even installed ice baths in their buses to super cool the brave few that believed low temperature treatment aided recovery. Sadly for them, most of these methodologies have been debunked. Hello? Can I have a towel? Yeah. These are the attributes required to cope with the world's hardest challenge. But what we can't measure here, thank goodness, is the courage, tenacity and downright cunning required to use them to their fullest.